Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Well, Raymond Terrace Community Church, it is great to see you. It's great to be back. And uh, if you're joining us online, it's great to have you with us too. Thanks for joining us. I, um, I see a lot of faces that I know, and that's wonderful. It's really like coming home. But I also see a lot of faces I don't know, um, and that's wonderful too. It's great to see you here. Um, if I don't know you, if I haven't met you before, like Chris has just said, there's probably quite a few of you that you have, haven't met me, um, I'm happy for a chat afterwards. I'd love to meet you. So feel free to come up and hit me up for a chat and we'll talk. Now, I want to start with a little quiz, or not a quiz, um, kind of a survey. I want you to just to answer this question in your mind. You don't have to yell anything out. <clears throat> if you were to go out on the, the street and ask the average person out there, or maybe someone you work with, or someone you, who doesn't come to church that you, that you know, what's, what's a story they know from the Bible? Assuming they don't know much about the Bible, what would be some, a story they know? What's the, think of the first story that comes to mind. I reckon it probably comes down to a pretty short list of a few stories that involve animals. Noah and the ark, um, Adam and Eve fighting with a snake in the garden, running around with no clothes on, um, and Jonah and the whale. Now, put your hand up if, you, if the first story you thought of was Jonah. Well, not many. Okay, not as many as I expected, but that's fine. I think, it prob I think I'm right on my short list, though. I think it's right up there with, with stories that most people know. If they know anything at all about the Bible, they've probably heard of that story. And it's a story that's really popular in Sunday school, isn't it? One that we teach the kids. Normally, when we teach the story of Jonah, it goes something like this. Jonah, uh, God gave Jonah a job to do. Jonah didn't want to do that job, so he ran away in the opposite direction. Got on a ship. Big storm comes up, God sent the storm, Jonah gets thrown overboard, got swallowed by a fish, God brought him back to the place where he was supposed to go, and Jonah finally decided to go and do what he was told in the first place. Moral lesson to the kids, do what you're told. <laughs> that's how we teach that book, isn't it? And that's because life is very simple when you're a kid. You know, when you're really small, your parents are really your whole world. They, they make everything happen. They make the food appear on the table. They give you a bed to sleep in. They put a roof over your head. Um, they, they fix you up when you fall over and hurt yourself. They know what has to happen and they make sure things happen the way they're supposed to. So mum and dad have got all the answers. When you get a bit older, the teachers have got most of the answers at school. You don't have to think too hard when you're a kid about the big questions in life. But growing up does involve wrestling with big questions, doesn't it? You can't get to adulthood and not think about some of the harder questions. Um, it does mean wrestling with hard questions. Questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Does God exist? Is there such a thing as ab absolute right and wrong? Or is it just everybody make up their own as they feel like? Lots of hard questions you have to grapple with when you grow up. And normally that happens when you're a teenager. But there are some questions that we, we get to the end of our life and we still haven't quite got a handle on the right answer for it. So some of these questions linger and they, and they, they cause us stress through our lives, even as adults. What does God think about us having these questions? How does he respond to us wrestling with issues that we, we can't seem to find the truth out of it? Does he approve or does he get annoyed? Um, you know, sometimes as parents, when we've got little kids asking us questions like, why is the sky blue and why is lemonade fizzy and, you know, where do clouds come from? Things like that. We can get a little bit irritated as parents if, if those questions go on too long because those, those questions do actually have answers, but to explain that to a toddler, they're not capable of understanding the, the answer. So it's, it's almost a futile thing to try and answer it. It's very frustrating to have questions constantly that you know you can't give a satisfactory answer to. So I wonder whether God gets annoyed by us having these questions. Or does he, is he okay with it? Well, we're going to look at Jonah chapter 2 today. Um, and that's the reason I started talking about the book of Jonah. And it helps us to see a little bit about how God deals with us wrestling with these hard questions. Um, I've called this talk the one that got away because in chapter one, the book of Jonah is only very short. If you've ever read it through, it's only four chapters. Chapter one, Jonah runs away, gets thrown overboard when the storm comes up and um, he, he, he runs away from God thinking he's going to get out of trouble, but he actually gets himself into trouble. He doesn't get away. So there's kind of a bit of an irony there. He thought he got away, but he didn't. In this chapter, chapter two, he's going to find himself in trouble that he thinks he can't get away from and unexpectedly he will. So there's kind of a double meaning to this title I've given the, the talk for us to think about. 
he, th he thought he got away, but he wound up finding himself drowning. Um, and that's because God rescues him. And what I really want to talk about today is a couple of different aspects of the way God rescues people. Three things, actually, as, as we look through this chapter, I'll, I'll, I'll put, be able to pull out three things, three aspects of the way God rescues. God rescues through suffering. God rescues despite our questions. And God rescues the undeserving. We're going to hit on all three of those as we, as we go through this chapter. So let me pray again briefly, and then we'll read the chapter together. Father, thank you uh, that your word speaks to us no matter how long ago it was written. No matter what the topic happens to be, it manages to speak to us. And we recognise that we are not the people you want us to be. We're not the people that we even want to be most of the time. Um, and it's only by listening to your word and having your Holy Spirit open it up to us and speak to us that we can make any change at all, any lasting change. So we pray for that this morning. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll be working in our lives and that we'll be listening to the living God and not just Steve Allen speak as we... Um, as we want to draw closer to you and learn more of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me read Jonah chapter 2. And I'm going to, actually going to start in chapter 1 at verse seven, 17, which is the last verse of chapter 1. It's, it'll, it's sort of part of this section. It'll help us to get some context. So Jonah's been on the ship. The storm's come up. He's been thrown overboard, and now he's floundering around in the ocean. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, and yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, your, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I love that line. <laughs> You're allowed to talk about spew in church. Isn't that good? <laughs> well, Jonah's really suffering. He's really suffering. He's in a very tough spot. What a story. So first of all, the storm comes up. It's not just the average, you know, southerly buster that comes up. This is a great storm, the Bible says. This is not just some natural storm. It's a supernatural thing that God has brought. Um, and Jonah gets tossed into the sea. Now, any time you read about the sea in the Bible, it generally makes you, it's, it's there to make you think about chaos, turmoil, danger. It was something that was mysterious and something to be afraid of. I mean, it still is something to be afraid of. But it was definitely, uh, th there was a sense of mystery all around the ocean. It was a dangerous, dangerous place to be. And Jonah's in it, and he's being smashed by waves. He's being pulled down in a rip. He's being sucked under. He's being held under. He's got seaweed wrapped around his head. And now he's been pinned to the bottom, like he's back against the wall, as it were. It says, you know, the, the um, uh, what does it say? The roots of the mountains. Uh, barred me in forever the earth beneath me barred me in so he's stuck on the floor of the ocean with seaweed around his head it's not a good place to be he's actually deep deep in trouble in fact you notice through that passage the word deep or depth comes out quite a few times he, the, the writer wants us to get the feeling of how deep he is in trouble and so he calls God for help pretty natural thing to do isn't it um, I mean, I'm not surprised that he called God for help, but I wonder, when I read that, I wonder what did he think God was going to do? What did he expect when he prayed for help? I mean, if it was me out in the ocean, I would be thinking to myself, well, I hope God sends a Westpac rescue helicopter to drop a line and pick me up. But even then, it would be a pretty slim chance of getting there before I drowned, I think. But I don't think Jonah was expecting anything like that. In fact, I'm not sure that he was expecting much at all. 
He certainly wasn't expecting to be swallowed by a fish. And if I was on the bottom of the ocean with seaweed wrapped around my head and I got swallowed by a fish, I would not see that as help. <laughs> I would see that as going from the frying pan into the fire. It's just getting from bad to worse. You know, the thought of being swallowed by anything is not a good thing. But see, Jonah, at this point, Jonah does something that you and I probably wouldn't do. And I think it's about the only thing that he does right in the whole book. He recognises God's hand of rescue in the fish, swallowing him. That's bizarre. But I mean, it couldn't get any worse for him before that, I suppose, could it, really? Um, but he, he recognises God's hand of rescue. So you see that in verses 6 and 9. Verse 6 says, But you, Lord, brought my, uh, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. It's not some random fish bringing my life up. This is God's work. This is God's doing, this fish coming along. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord, not from a fish, not from my own good luck. God is behind his rescue, and he recognises that right here. So that's good. I wonder if you have ever felt like you were drowning. I mean... You probably, you might have even felt like you were literally drowning in the ocean, but I'm talking figuratively. I wonder if you have ever felt like you were drowning in life. Chances are you probably have. I think it's pretty rare for anybody to get to adulthood, certainly for anybody to get to my age, and not have experienced some sort of turmoil or chaos or trouble, something to be feared, something very uh, upsetting in their life. Sometimes things go sideways in our lives where we do need God to step in and do something where we have no control, where we have no hope, no way of getting ourselves out of the situation. But the thing I get, and I think that's pretty common, I mean, we, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, we look at our lives and we say, yeah, there are problems that we have that we need help with. But what I think we get from this chapter that's a little bit surprising is that sometimes God's rescue can take an unexpected form. Instead of God, see what he did with Jonah, instead of calming the storm, Suddenly, God, Jonah finds himself drowning. Instead of sending a helicopter, sometimes, um, God, in this case, God sent something to swallow him whole, and that was the rescue. Sometimes the rescue is in the vomit. Sometimes it is. I wonder if you remember a few years ago, there was a news story about um, a soccer team in Thailand, a boys' soccer team that got stuck in the caves. Do you remember that? When the, they were getting flooded in and they couldn't get themselves out. That was, a, that, was, that was a really dramatic news story. The whole world was watching to see what was going to happen. And these poor kids were stuck in the cave. They had no light, or very little light, I think. They had no, uh, no very little water, no food. Only half of them could swim. They had no way of getting themselves out. Um, and when the rescuers finally got in there to find them, the kids had to be willing to trust them enough to be sedated and be carried out through the twists and turns in all the caves. It was very complex, very dangerous, very scary, even for the rescuers. Um, it was a difficult rescue. But see, that difficult, scary process was the rescue. It was the rescue. And for Jonah, the fish was the rescue. Sometimes for us, the suffering is the rescue. It might not seem like it at the time. We might, not want to, we might not even want to acknowledge it at the time because the suffering is so bad. All we want is to be picked up by the rescue helicopter. We want the easy way, but sometimes it's not going to be simple. It's the same for us. Some of the suffering we face, some of it's self-inflicted, right? That's true. Some of, some, we just do stupid things and we cause our own problems. Um, that's, that's one part of our suffering. But some of our suffering is suffering that God allows to come our way and it's, he allows us to go through it because it actually is his means of rescuing from something worse or something else. So point number one, remember, if, God, if our hearts are turned towards God like Jonah's was, if, he's turned, if our hearts are turned towards him, God is acting for our good, even when we can't understand it. Sometimes God rescues through suffering. That's number one. All right, number two, God also rescues us sometimes when we have questions. Now, this, this gets back to the, question, the, the point that I was making at the very beginning, how um, we have questions that we struggle with, and Jonah had questions. So ask yourself, why was Jonah in this predicament in the first place? How did he find himself drowning in the ocean? Well, the storm that came was God's response to Jonah running away from what he was told to do, wasn't it? Why was Jonah running? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. I think there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, 
the mission itself. God asked him to go to a city called Nineveh. And if you know anything about Nineveh, you'll know that it was the capital of Assyria. Assyria was the dominant empire of the world. It was like the Roman Empire, only earlier. And the Assyrian Empire was known for its brutality. They would conquer nations all around them and they would inflict all sorts of war crimes and atrocities on the people around them. Dreadful, dreadful things. And I would say the first reason Jonah didn't want to go is because he was terrified. And I think that's how I would be. If somebody asked me to go to the Taliban and tell them, God's going to punish you for what you're doing, um, so look out, I would be terrified to do that too. Yeah. Thankfully, God hasn't asked me to do that. Um, but I think there's a second reason why Jonah ran away and didn't want to do what he was told. There's a clue coming later on in chapter 4. Now, we're, obviously, we're not reading the whole book, so I'm going to jump forward. But in chapter 3, after Jonah gets out of the fish, in chapter 3, he goes and preaches to the people in Nineveh and they repent. They, God, the, God says, I'm going to punish you. They change their, their tune and say, OK, we're going to stop behaving the way we've been behaving. And God says, all right, I won't punish you. That's chapter 3. Chapter 4, Jonah gets mad about that. He doesn't like what God has done. And he says in verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I was trying to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents on sending calamity. That's hilarious, isn't it? He ran away because he knew God was a forgiving God. God wanted to give grace. He wanted to extend grace to the people of Nineveh. See, I think that verse is so important. I think that's actually the punchline of the whole book. That God is a gracious and compassionate God. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. He is like that. He doesn't want to punish people. And I think so many people in the world have got this wrong idea about God, or certainly the wrong idea about the Christian God, that all he wants to do is, is kick them in the backside for the things they're doing wrong. And God wants to relent from that. God doesn't want to bring calamity on people. God is a gracious and compassionate God, and we need to remember that. We need to be clear on that. So this whole thing that's been happening to Jonah is because he's been wrestling with God with one of these big questions. Now, it's not explicitly written in the text, but the question Jonah is asking is, what should be done with evil people? That's a question we ask. What should be done with evil people? God wants to give people of Nineveh a chance to repent and to avoid the judgment, avoid the punishment. But Jonah doesn't like that answer. I wonder whether you and I are like that, whether we look at the things that people are doing around us, which may well be so much worse than what we're doing. I mean, we can look at the Russians invading Ukraine. We can look at drug dealers that are ruining people's lives. We can look at people who are involved in human trafficking. And we can say, God, what are you going to do about those things? What will our reaction be if he says, I want to forgive them. I want to relent from bringing calamity on those people. Will we react like Jonah? Will we be mad about it because God wants to forgive them? It doesn't sit well with us. It does not sit well with our sense of right and wrong, our sense of justice, to, to say that somebody that's done something that we think is so much worse than what we do uh, might be forgiven for it. See, God is going to work on Jonah's attitude. That's what this whole episode with the fish is about. He's working on Jonah's attitude. And the first step to, to, uh, to fixing his attitude is answering his question, this big question, what should be done with evil people? Well, Jonah, I'm going to show you what should be done with evil people. Jonah gets a chance to feel the weight of God's judgment. Now, this is not to say that Jonah was being punished, but it's kind of like God is saying, well, Jonah, you want, to, you want the Assyrians to suffer punishment, Here's a little taste of what you're asking for me to do to them. He, he gets to feel the weight of it. And I think that's a good thing. It's a wake-up call for Jonah because he, he needs to see uh, the, things way, the way God sees them. Understand why God doesn't want to bring this calamity on people. But sadly, Jonah still doesn't get it. You know, he only makes a small step back towards God. It says there, you know, I will turn my, I'll turn my eyes towards the temple. So... While he's in the fish, his heart is kind of turning to God. He's calling for help. But it's only a small step back towards God. He's only thankful for his rescue, his own rescue. He's not interested in anybody else's rescue yet. He's only interested in his. He's mainly thinking about himself. He never admits that he was wrong to run away. It's more like the two-year-old that goes and cleans his room because he's made to. 
He does it with gritted teeth. He never admits that he was wrong. He never admits that God was right to offer grace to the people who'd, who should be punished. Jonah never repents in the book. Jonah is a prophet of God who has a problem with God. He's got questions, he's got doubts, he's got a bad attitude. And God has to work on that. But see, even, you know, even when he goes to Nineveh and does what he's told, he still has gritted teeth. He still has tensions and struggles and doubts. And he still doesn't really agree with what God's doing. But God rescues him anyway. That's really good news. He rescues him anyway. God can see very clearly, more clearly than we can really, what kind of a rotten attitude Jonah has and how long he's carrying it for. And God still rescues him. God doesn't wait until we understand everything, until we've got all the answers figured out. Um, some of Jonah's questions that he was asking are the kind of questions that we are still asking today. Who should God show mercy to? Just the good people? Show me one. <laughs> who, how can he forgive people who I think are worse than me? You know, I can see how he can forgive the really good people, but I can't see how he could forgive that guy or that guy or that, because they're worse than me. I mean, I'm on this side of the line, so I should be forgiven. But anybody on that side of the line... Sorry, Chris, Kath. Um, anybody on that side of the line is in trouble. They should get punished. Um, you know, why does God allow suffering? That's another one of the really hard questions that we, that we wrestle with all our lives. And some of these questions, we never get to the end... Of, we don't get to the end of our lives with a clear answer. Some of them we, we have to hold in tension and sort of still wonder. We've got question marks that hang around. Do you remember, um, some of you will remember a TV show, I think it was previously a book, called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Who remembers that? Yeah. Okay. You'll remember that the main theme of that book was the idea that these guys were going on their journey trying to discover the answer to the life, the universe and everything, weren't they? Life, the universe and everything. And they got to the very end of the story, in the final episode, and they found out what the answer was. The answer to life, the universe and everything was 42 which is ridiculous. That's the joke of the book, of course. It is it's making the point that there are questions that we can't really come up with answers for. And we are going to have questions that just hang around and nag us. Some of these questions we don't have answers for and, and we, God doesn't ask us to figure everything out before he's willing to rescue us. It's just as well. Because some of the questions won't ever be answered in this lifetime. Instead, God asks us to turn towards him and to trust him, not to figure him out. His rescue doesn't depend on our answers. And I'm pleased about that. That's number two. So God rescues us through suffering sometimes. He rescues us even though we've got these questions that won't go away. And he finally, he rescues the undeserving. Because Jonah still has, right at the end of the book, he's still got his questions and his doubts and his bad attitude and everything. God rescues him anyway. See, Jonah needed to be rescued but he didn't deserve to be rescued. That's different. He really needed it, but he didn't deserve it. I wonder whether you noticed, something I noticed when I was reading through this chapter was how active God is from beginning to end. It's not just Jonah and the fish or Jonah and the storm or Jonah and the seaweed. It's Jonah and God through all these things. Um, and God is, God is active. Um, first of all, he's active in, he's in rescue mode. You can see that. Uh, chapter 1, verse 17, God provided a great fish. Chapter 2, verse 2, he answered me. You listened to my cry. Verse 6, you brought my life up from the pit. Verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish. So God's doing stuff all the way through, all the way through. But not only is he in rescue mode, but he's also in judgment mode. Take a look at verse 3. Verse 3, you hurled me. Your breakers swept over me. Now that makes it a little bit confusing. Because God is, on one hand, God is in rescue mode and at the very same time he's in judgment mode. Well, it kind of makes sense in one way because you don't need rescue if there's no judgment going on. But God seems to be trying to do both of these things at the same time. What, what, mode, what is he trying to do? Is he, is he, what's he on about? Is he on about rescuing or is he on about judging? If he wants to rescue Jonah, then why, don't you, why doesn't he just calm the storm straight away? pick him out of there, get him back to the job that he's supposed to be doing without all this fuss with the fish and everything. If, that, if God's ultimate game plan was to rescue Jonah, why go through all this? But by the same token, if God's main game was to judge Jonah, then why rescue him? 
Why not just let him be swallowed by the fish and that's the end of Jonah? That's judgment. But he didn't do, he didn't do that. He did both at both. It was sort of yes and yes and no at the same time. It's because God is doing something very important to Jonah in this episode with the fish. He's confronting Jonah with his own sin. With his own sin. Jonah's been thinking up until this point, um, there should be justice for, every, justice for everybody else and mercy for me. Justice for them, mercy for me. And we tend to think the same way, don't we? We tend to think, God, I love God because he's going to show me mercy, but I also love God because he's, he's got justice and he will punish the evildoers and take care of all those guys, everybody else. But I'm okay and I, that's why I love him. And God's got to you know, clarify that picture a little bit for Jonah and for us. And that's why he allows Jonah to feel some of the weight of the judgment that he deserves himself. Not just what the Assyrians deserve, but what Jonah deserves. Because Jonah is just as much a rebel as the Ninevites. He's just as undeserving of rescue as the Ninevites. And he's just as in need of rescue as the Ninevites. God's showing Jonah that he's in the same category. He's not separate and apart. Not at this point, anyway. He's, um, he's just as much in need of it. And you and I also need to be confronted with the reality of who we really are. We each need to have a Jonah moment. I had a Jonah moment a few years ago, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, my wife Carmen and I went through a really hard time in our marriage because of my sin. And uh, that was a very rough time for us. It went on for a little while. And I felt like I was drowning. And I didn't really expect to be rescued. And uh, we, we paid a high price as a couple for my sin. And, um, but going through that, <coughs> well, before that happened, I, before, <laughs> before I was confronted with this, these details about myself, before that I thought... I'm doing all right. I'm a pretty good Christian. God's lucky to have me on his team. If he had more people like me, God's kingdom would be on fire. We'd be doing great. I wouldn't have said it quite like that, but that's kind of how I felt. And God had to change that attitude in me. And so by going through this horrible time of seeing my own sin and understanding some of the consequences or the potential consequences of my sin, um, I learned firsthand, firsthand, that I'm just as undeserving of rescue as anybody, just as much as the Ninevites. And I learned also that, I, that he rescues the undeserving. I was undeserving, just like Jonah. I discovered that about myself more clearly than I had ever known it before. And so this is not just theory for me. When I read about God loving us and forgiving us and paying the price, it's no longer just something that I read in a book and talk about. I've experienced this. It's firsthand experience. So the, God, the grace of God in the gospel is clearer to me than it's ever been, than it ever was before. And I think that every Christian, certainly everybody in the world eventually, but every Christian that wants to follow Jesus will at some point, God will confront them with the harsh reality of their own sin. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, if you haven't been confronted. Because if you're serious about following Jesus, he will make you take a good hard look at yourself at some point like he did with me, like he did with Jonah, and like he has done with some of you. Now, that can be hard news to hear if you had my previous attitude of, oh, I'm pretty good, I'm doing okay. If you think you're doing okay and you get confronted with who you really are, it'll be hard to swallow. But if you're, maybe you are already aware of your sin and already aware of the weight of it and the, the gravity of it, and possibly... Some of you here, or maybe watching online, you could be overwhelmed right now with the depth of your own sin. This is good news for you. And it is good news for all of us, once we understand who we really are, that God does rescue the undeserving, because we are all undeserving. But I'll tell you, we need someone better than Jonah to come and tell that story to us. We do. We need someone better than Jonah. If Jonah comes to me and says, Steve, this is what's wrong with your life, you know, 40 days and then the Lord's going to punish you kind of thing, um, there's room for me to push back. I can say, don't talk to me, Jonah. I, I've, I've read the book. 
I know what you're like. I know you've got this bad attitude. And I know you were arguing with God about punishing people and whether he should give grace to people or not. So you're in no position to criticise me. We need someone better than Jonah. But when Jesus comes along in uh, Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to read a little bit from that. Jesus, in that chapter, talks, talks about himself in terms related to Jonah. Uh, he's in a discussion with the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, and they say to him, well, you think you're the son of God, that's what you're claiming? Okay, you better show us a sign or show us, do some sort of trick for us to prove who you are. And Jesus says, well, I'm not here to do tricks. I'm not doing any tricks for you, but I will, show you, I will give you a sign, something to think about that shows you who I am. Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 to 41. For as, this is Jesus speaking. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. See, Jesus is saying very clearly that he is greater than Jonah. A bit strange him talking about three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I mean, you and I, in hindsight, we know he's talking about being buried and then rising again. We, we get that. But I don't know what the Pharisees thought he was talking about. They would have been scratching their heads. What on earth is he on about? How on earth can he be greater than Jonah? Jonah was someone that God used. I mean, we look at Jonah and think he wasn't that great. The bar wasn't very high, really. But um, the Pharisees would have looked back at Jonah and he was a prophet. He had a book in the Old Testament and he, God had used him to turn the Assyrians to repentance. It was a, he was a prophet, a great thing. How can this person, this Jesus, be better than Jonah? I'll give you a few ways that he's different to Jonah. Jonah moved away from God to avoid God's call on his life. Jesus left heaven to, to carry out God's call, to fulfill God's call. It's the opposite to Jonah. Jonah was hurled into a storm of his own making and then rescued. Jesus was hurled into a storm of my making and he was left there to die. Jonah had a taste of judgment. He just felt the weight of it. Jesus experienced the full force of God's judgment. Jonah came out of the whale and still had his job to do. Jesus came out of the grave and it was mission accomplished. Jonah was motivated by fear and obligation, like the two-year-old cleaning his room. Jesus was motivated by love, something far stronger. Jesus is the better Jonah. He is. So when he challenges me about my sin, it's much harder to push back. The ultimate statement from God about the reality of our sin is the cross. If you want to know what your sin really looks like to God, look at the cross. It cost Jesus far more than words to express the seriousness of our sin. It cost him his life. He rescues the undeserving, the Jonas, the Ninevites, the Peters, the Pauls, the Davids, the Steves of this world. And the only thing he stands to gain out of it is us. A relationship with us that isn't possible, for him, isn't possible at all if we're running away from him. It's not until our hearts are turned towards him that that's possible. So if we learn anything from this chapter at all, it's that God is ready and willing to save us from ourselves. Even though we're undeserving, even though we're wrestling with questions and unresolved doubts, and even though our rescue sometimes involves suffering. The ultimate rescue from the ultimate problem involved Jesus facing the ultimate suffering in our place. If we can only see that, then we'll be able to turn to him and trust him in those times when we feel like we're drowning. Sometimes the rescue will be quick and easy. Sometimes it will be slow and difficult. Sometimes it will be in the vomit. But one thing is certain. God has not forgotten you. Usually it's the other way around. We forget him. And that's why we come to the table week after week or month after month, depending on your tradition. The table communion helps us to remember what Jesus did and so we're going to gather around the table shortly let me pray and then I'll hand over to others to to lead that <clears throat> father thank you that um, a book that was written so long ago and on the surface seems quite simple has so many layers in it that can speak to our lives for those of us that are suffering I pray that you would help us to turn to you and trust you 
even when it seems like it's impossible, when it's difficult and scary. Help us to hand our lives and our situations over to you and to know that you have our best interests at heart if we're trusting you, if we're turned towards you. For those of us that have questions, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be willing to trust you and turn to you even when the questions haven't been answered, even when they may never be answered. Lord, when we feel like we're undeserving or when we are starting to realise that we are undeserving, Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, understand the, the price that was paid that allows you to have a relationship with us even though we are undeserving. We commit ourselves to you, Lord. Thank you for, your, for speaking to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.